chapter 23, the book of Job. As you're looking down at the first three or four verses, I would like to remind you of Ruth. There's an entire book written about Ruth in the Bible. She is one of only five women that Matthew names in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, our King. Along with Mary, Tamar, Rahab, and the wife of Uriah, which we know as Bathsheba, is Ruth. Only five women out of all those generations, God led Matthew to name by name as the parents, grandparents of our king. Because you're students of scripture, you know that Ruth was a Moabite. She was one of three widowed daughters-in-law of Naomi. She was the one who would not stay in Moab, but insisted to return to Bethlehem, the hometown of Naomi, with her mother-in-law. When Naomi arrived at the gate, she was greeted by the other ladies of Bethlehem. And this is what she said, quote, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. <clears throat> Interestingly, the word Naomi in Hebrew means pleasant. The word Mara means bitter. Since you know the story, you know that from a human perspective, Naomi had all the right reasons to be bitter. Her husband wanted to leave Israel and go to Moab, so she went with him, taking her three sons, who married three Moab women. Then her husband died, and each of her three sons died, leaving her with three widows. So she decides to go back home. She tells all three women, look, you're still young enough to have children. Stay. Ruth refused. But what struck me was, she is not all that different in attitude than Job. Look down at your Bible and look at the first three verses. What I want to camp out on just a little bit is it is very difficult and it's just as important as it is hard that we not allow circumstances to make us bitter. Here we go. Then Job answered and said, even today my complaint is bitter. My hand is listless because of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. For similar reason as Ruth, <coughs> Job has reached the point of bitterness. We saw last week the words of Eliphaz filled with mockery and ridicule <coughs> for no comfort, no help. And here, now, Job is saying to his friend, the hand of God is upon me heavier than you see. His judgment upon me is greater than you think. It is greater than all my groanings. Job is bitter, and why shouldn't he be? He has lost everything, like Ruth lost everything. <clears throat> bitter in Hebrew is a very interesting word. It's mara, as we've already seen. It appears early in scripture because it was the kind of herb God asked the Israelites to eat on the first Passover. Lamb with bitter herbs. Because you study scripture, you know when they travel through the wilderness, a lot of times they come upon water, which they called Mara, 
bitter. They couldn't drink it. It was so bad. Job will use the same word again in chapter 27, verse 2, as God lives, who has taken away my justice, and the Almighty, who has made my soul bitter. He is sinking lower and lower and lower. To the point that he says to Eliphaz, and it's recorded in these opening verses, three, please look where it's read, oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. That's Job, that's not you. See, Job is in such a state of despair and depression, and not fully aware of what you know. Oh, that Job knew what you know now, if he knew it then. He would know exactly that he could go to the judgment seat of the Almighty and plead his case. But he doesn't feel that way. He doesn't have that invitation that you have. You don't have to carry all of your anger and your wrath and your bitterness around. You can just take it to the Lord. Amen. Leave it at the foot of the cross. Be done with it. And there's some application that we're going to try to make with the promise he has. The word bitter, Mark, can also be translated, you already know this, I think, but look at your faces, angry, chafed, discontented. All of those words are used in the Old Testament to carry the idea of reaching the point of bitterness. I think Job at this point was settled just being angry. But he is sunk deeper than that. Some of you would like to get rid of anger before it becomes bitterness. Because when it turns into bitterness, it becomes oppressive, which leads to depression. Which brings us to point one. There is no room for bitterness. None. Don't allow it. Get rid of it. Because you know where to go, verse 3, go there. Job would have loved to have that invitation. You have it. Verse 2, your complaint should not be bitter. Now you may be experiencing some bitterness in your life. Unload it. You may have some bitterness that's so heavy you can't even raise your hands to pray. Unload it. Your bitterness may be so sour that you can't even hear yourself think over your groaning. Get rid of it. Now, interestingly, the word bitter also appears in the New Testament. The most... Let me just read it. You decide most of it, whatever. Book of Revelation, chapter 8, verse 11, reads thusly. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. That is an act of the judgment wrath of God upon planet Earth for the people who refused to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. That wormwood would come and attack the water and make it bitter. The Greek word for wormwood is absthenith. Does that ring a bell? It's an illegal alcoholic beverage because it's so toxic. So instead of calling this beverage wormwood, which nobody would buy, they give it another name. Do you see the connection there? God is saying, look, there is coming a time when I'm going to judge planet Earth and I'm going to send a toxic chemical into the water and it will be so bitter that men will die when they drink it. They'll be so thirsty and they will want to die, they'll drink it anyway. So what I'm saying is, bitter and bitterness 
wrath, anger needs to be avoided at all possible costs. There is no room for it in your life and in the church. May I quote James to prove the point. Chapter 3, 10 and 11. James is writing to the church. He's writing to us. Quote, Out of the same mouth proceeded blessings and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not to be. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? That is in the context of controlling your tongue. Out of your mouth should not become becoming words of refreshment and words of anger from the same source. Now Paul takes the same concept and he makes it even more applicable, especially now. Quote, Why? Submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Gentlemen, from the Lord, we're commanded through Paul to the church of Colossae and to us, let us not provoke our wives to bitterness. Now James has the remedy for that. We just have to go there and read it and then do it. As the men go through it, we say, boy, this sounds so easy. <laughs> easy is the wrong word. So like the beverage, wormwood, keep it out of the house. Now last week we noticed that bad theology leads to bad behavior. Eliphaz had the wrong concept of who God was, therefore he interpreted what was God doing to Job incorrectly. He was unkind, driving Job to bitterness. So bad response to bad counsel through Job led to an incorrect action. I'm trying to suggest to us as the family of God that we not do what he did, but do what you're invited to do, and that's take it to the cross. Lay it before the feet of the Lord. <coughs> Let verse 3 be your mantra. The opposite of verse 3 be your mantra. Mm -hmm. Job is saying, oh, I wish I knew where to go. I want you to leave today saying, I know exactly where to go. Amen. You have the invitation to come before the Lord. We just sang a chorus about going into his holy place. <coughs> the next room in the holy place was the holy of holies. Remember your New Testament? What curtain was torn when Jesus died? That curtain. Granting access for everyone through the holy place to the holy of holies, to the ark of the covenant, to the bema seat, to the place where the blood was shed, to the sins of Israel sprinkled on the ark of the covenant. So remarkable is that throughout scripture, many archaeologists believe they will find the ark of the covenant in Jerusalem, perhaps very near where the blood of Christ was shed. One in particular thinks it is inside Golgotha somehow. Though I don't know, but it's possible. If the blood of the sacrifice in the days of Aaron had to be sprinkled seven times on the ark to atone for all the sins of Israel, could it be that the blood of the Lamb of God who took away all the sins be sprinkled in the same place. I don't know. Is it necessary? No. It's kind of fun to think about though, isn't it? What I'm suggesting is God has cleared the path. We don't need a priest. We 
We don't need anybody but Jesus. We walk right in. <coughs> There's the throne. Father God, help me. Amen. We just opened with Psalm 31. We just <coughs> sang Psalm 62. David got that. I want you to get that. You have free and open access to the very throne room of God. And when you get there, be respectful. But plead your case. Which is what Job wants to do in the next few verses. Now I want to read this long section, verses 4 through 12. Please follow along in your own Bible. <clears throat> I would present my case before him, and I would fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which I would answer. He would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Really? Would he contend with me in his great power? No, but he would take note of me. There the upright could reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Look, I go forward, but he's not there. <coughs> and back, and I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him, and when he turns to the right, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than necessary food. But he is unique. And who can make him change? <coughs> and whatever his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore I'm terrified. Verse 15. You hear what he's saying? What he's saying I feel like I'm just spinning in circles looking for God. I look to the left and he's not there. I turn to the right and he's not there. It's so dark I can't see him, but, but I know he's, I, I, I think, I hope he's there. I think he sees me. I hope he hears me. You notice how I proceeded. First they began, I know what I'm going to say. I'm going to go right in there. I'm not going to talk to God Almighty. And slowly, he <coughs> returns to reality. Nobody marches into the throne room of God and tells God what's going to happen. <laughs> now, Job felt like that. And maybe he deserved to feel like that. Not really. But he is <coughs> so bitter, so downtrodden, so full of bad advice and counsel, he feels totally and completely abandoned. Sound familiar? It is easy to let the circumstances of our world spin us in circles, get us so confused and dizzy, we forget on whom we're supposed to trust. Don't. Don't allow that to happen. Even in your darkest time, God is still there. He is only a breath away to hear your prayers. Don't be an Esau. Don't sell your birthright for food. Don't sell your soul for groceries. And as the time approaches, don't sell your eternity and take the mark. Be aware of what's going on. Be full of the Holy Spirit, led by Him, so that you're not fooled by what they might say. Now, don't be confused. I am not saying, I underline and embolden the word not, I am not saying that the COVID vaccination is the mark of the beast. That is not true. If you think you should take it, Take it. If you don't want to take it, don't. But don't relegate it to some 
theological darkness over there. The mark of the beast will require you to first deny Jesus is Lord mm -hmm. and then worship the beast. Mm -hmm. It won't be standing in line to get a social security card. Remember those days, gentlemen? <laughs> it won't be your draft notice. Remember those days? It won't be the requirement of the COVID-19 vaccination. It will be something far more sinister. Be steadfast in your faith in who Jesus is, and when you know that you're right, stand firmly on the truth of God. There's no other way of looking at it. Which leads us to verse 15 through the end. I'm going to back up to verse 13 and get a running start of what Job's going to try to tell us today. Verse 13. But God is unique, and who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore I am terrified in his presence. And when I consider this, I am afraid of him. For God made my heart weak. And the Almighty terrifies me because I was not cut off from the presence of darkness and he did not hide deep darkness from my face. You hear what he's saying? He has reached the point of despair where he's become terrified of God. He went from, I'm going to walk in there and straighten things out, to I am so afraid I don't even want to talk. <clears throat> Verse 13, he is unique. Well, of course he's unique. He's God. <laughs> I don't want to make fun of Job. He's in anguish. And he does whatever his soul desires. That's partly true. The New Testament says that God desires that all should be saved. So if Job is absolutely 100% correct, then God could just save everybody and all of this be done. But God has a character, righteousness, holiness, that prevents him from doing whatever he wants to do. So that first has to be interpreted in light of all of Scripture. Is it true that God desires everybody, everyone to be saved? Yes. Does that mean he's just going to save everyone because that's what he wants? No. God is love. Period. That's what we're teaching the kids next door. I'm hoping as they mature they'll understand the difference between God is love and God is loving. I want them to understand the difference between God is love and God is merciful, gracious, kind, and long-suffering. His very character is love. We sing it. Love, love, love. That is who He is. He is loving because He is love. Does that mean he cannot hate? No. He hates sin that destroys the relationship between him and his creation. So don't be confused. Don't let our children become confused. Marsh and I were watching some videos the last several days. And one of them was on Sunday school lessons. Excellent. And the speaker was saying what our Sunday school has already decided to do. The speaker was suggesting that Sunday school teachers eliminate the word story from the vocabulary next door. We're already doing that. For a simple reason. We don't want our children to hear a story about Jesus and confuse that with a story of Christmas. Yeah. or Aesop fable. So when our children sit on their grandparents' lap and grandma's going to read them a story, 
we want our kids to understand, oh, this is a story, which, which may or may not be true, but what we learn over there is an historical event. Amen. So we're already attempting to do that, but after decades of using the word story, it is difficult. So if your children come home with you and they say, well, we learned about the story of Jesus turning water into wine, listen to them, and then later, when the time is right, say, wow, do you think Jesus actually did that? Well, yeah. Ah, now it's an historical event. The reason I say that is there needs to be a very close union between what takes place over there and what takes place in your home. We need to be on the same page. We need to be saying, using the same words. So when you're teaching your children that this is what they need to do, it corresponds to what we're teaching over there. So when we're teaching your child they should honor and obey you, and in here you're learning about what it means to be honorable and deserving of obedience, they're working together. One of the toughest counseling appointments a person can ever have is when a teenager comes up to you and says, the Bible says I have to obey my father no matter what. Is that true? That's what the Bible says. There are no exceptions in the word. Children, honor and obey your parents. And then she proceeded to tell us how dishonorable her dad really was. And that's why you wanted to say no. The scripture doesn't give a caveat in that verse. You have to expound the context to see what can a dad do, what can his behavior be that excludes them to absolute obedience to this person. That's what makes applying the word of God a little bit more difficult than just saying, well, that's what it means to do. I heard a person say that one time. Counseling people be very easy. All you need is a stack of brand new Bibles. So the person walks in, sits down, and you say, good afternoon. And the person says, you want to hear my problem? No. Take this. Do what it says. Next! <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice sometimes when your children are being especially disobedient to walk in and say to them, see this? Read it. If you don't read it, I'm going to teach it to you. Line by line. <laughs> My mind just went somewhere it needs to come back from. <laughs> I need to go back to what the Bible is saying here. Even in your darkness, even in your bitterness, I want you to sense that God is right there. Job is almost to the point that he cannot. I don't want you to get close to where Job is. Now, Paul explains and James explains, the letters in the New Testament tell us how to remedy bitterness. Let all anger, wrath, bitterness be removed with malice. With malice is the last two words in that command. Now there's two ways of reading that. Along with anger and wrath and bitterness include malice. Another way to read it is remove anger and wrath and bitterness without prejudice. It's gone. I don't want it. It doesn't belong in my house, it doesn't belong in my heart, it doesn't belong in my family, it doesn't belong in my church. Both are reasonable. I think what I'm trying to convey to you is, don't be Job. Don't allow what's going on in the world to oppress you to the point that you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say. You do know what to say. And I want you to have the courage to just go say it. I repeat what I said last week. The time has come, and you know it's here, 
that no matter what you say or how you're, you say it, you're going to be offensive. You're going to offend somebody. The news is already reporting what the world is doing to the church. They are saying of you, we need to be deprogrammed. Because our view doesn't agree with their view, we need to be deprogrammed because we've been a part of a cult. They're using those words. That's not who we are. We belong to God Almighty. We are His children. We are born again. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. We are children of God. We're standing on His promise. Be not afraid. That's the phrase I want you to leave with. Job was so terrified, he didn't even want to talk to God. If you look in your concordance, how many times in the New Testament the phrase, fear not, do not fear, and don't be afraid of fear, you're going to be shocked. Do not a fear appears 47 times. Add to that, fear not, and do not be afraid. You think God's trying to tell us something? <laughs> Don't be afraid. Fear not. There will come a time when those on the planet will be afraid. And their response will be correct. Terror. Let me just give you a glimpse from the book of Revelation on what it's going to be like from a positive point of view. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1. And when I saw him, this is John Raymond. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Mm -hmm. But he laid his right hand on me saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives, was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and of death. Exclamation point. When John saw his Savior glorified in heaven, his reaction was to fall at his feet as though dead. Jesus, being who he is, took that as terror, fear. Reaches down with his right hand, and John could feel that and said that I heard him say, don't be afraid. But that's not all Jesus said. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He not only wants us to not be afraid, he wants us to remember who he is. Yes. Sitting in our congregation again this morning is a young man who has been called to a ministry of going wherever the Lord leads him to especially talk to young people. And he has learned by experience and by inspiration not to use the same cliches that we have used for decades. We, on Tuesday morning, are praying for a revival. We are praying that all of this chaos and crisis will lead to a resurgence of faith in America. Even back there, two men prayed that today, if there's someone sitting in this room who does not know Jesus, would confess their faith in Him and be saved today. Amen. That's how heavy it is on our heart. He has come up with a slightly different phrase. Remembrance. He's borrowing from communion. Jesus' words that when we take communion we remember him. Borrowing from that 
he is praying that our young people will have a remembrance, that God would restore a remembrance. I think that's fantastic. I think his prayer to God is spot on. It is based on the confidence that many of whom he's talking to have been told the truth. It's in there. It's been overshadowed by the world. And he's praying that the Lord will give him the words and the love to say to them, remember what you know? Remember what you know? One story to illustrate the point. In the historical events of Jesus, he's traveling and he's healing people. And one of the people in the crowd is a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. Now in her culture, she is unclean. Jesus is teaching, he's healing. A man walks over and says, Rabbi, my daughter is very ill. Would you come and heal her? He turns to go. He turns to leave. The lady with the issue of blood says, if he's Messiah, according to Malachi, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. If he's Messiah, I'll be healed. If he's not, and he really is a rabbi, I'll be stoned to death. Either way, I win. <laughs> now the Bible doesn't give that part. <laughs> what the Bible says, if you reached out and touched the hem of his garment. Now when I was a youngster, I thought she was reaching, but since he was moving away, she just kept going lower and lower. And in desperation, cut the very hem of his garment. I don't think that anymore. I think because of what Malachi, there shall be healing in his wings, said Malachi. If you look at the word wings in Hebrew, it is also used to refer to the hem of a garment. I think she was taught in Sabbath school, when the Messiah comes, if you just touch the hem of his garment, you'll be healed. If you go back in the Gospels and look up the word hem, they were doing that very thing. And she was healed. And what did Jesus say to her? Your faith has made you whole. An interesting word. Not healed, not cured, not saved. Whole. I love it. And when our kids hear that event, I want them to know that Jesus is real. And when they do what they're taught there, and what they see exampled at home, when they pray to him, he answers and they are made whole. I don't want fear. I want respect <coughs> to the Lord. I want them to be so comfortable with God, they freely talk to them. I know I said one more story, but <laughs> you ever had the fun event when one of your children decide they want to give grace at the table? Some of those are really, really good. Some of them are very short. Thank you, God, amen, let's eat. And then when the rest of the adults still have their heads bowed, you'll hear a little voice go, I said, amen. <laughs> oh, those were the days. And then there's the other example, where the entire meal is growing cold. <laughs> because our little precious child is thanking God for everything, one at a time. And for grandma, for grandpa, for the kitty and the doggy and the goldfish. Remember those days? <laughs> See, that's precious. And that's why God wants to hear from us. It is precious in his ear when you come to him as a child of God and talk to him. So, 
There is no reason to approach God in fear, regardless of your age. There's no room for bitterness. None. In your heart, your spirit, in our homes, in our churches. Let's just know each other. Amen? Amen. Amen.